Excellent, right. So, yes, welcome to the talk. My name is Nicholas Adams. I work with a company called TI Tokyo. Um, before we delve into the talk, I'd like to have a quick check on people in here. Who here has used a NoSQL data, uh, sorry, NoSQL database before? Quick show of hands. Almost everybody. I am impressed. Well done, people. Okay. Who has used React before? Who uses React now? We're still getting there. I'm impressed. Still got hands up. How many people use one of the open source versions of React? Want it? Oh, well done, people. I'm seriously impressed. Thank you. That shows somebody's having effects somewhere. Well done. Thank you. OK, that gives us a nice feel of who's here today. So thank you very much for that. You've made me a happy man already. Um, moving on to talk about the contents of actually, I should probably introduce myself first. Uh, why am I here? Um, you may, if you've used the open source version of React, you may realize that you probably downloaded the packages from a website called tiot.jp. If that package was one of the recent open source ones, that's probably one of the ones I made. So that's why I'm here. I make packages. I don't really code much because I'm not that good. But I make packages, and people seem happy with them, so that's why I'm here. Um, in, hey, in today's talk, we're going to be talking about an introduction for people who are not familiar with React. We're going to do a very brief introduction of what it does, uh, what's new in the newer stuff. We're going to talk about how you actually get there if you're using an older version, which is probably a relevant question for quite a few people. Oh, that still says performance demo. Uh, time restrictions, we had to ax that. That's now performance test, sorry, typo. And um, we're going to talk about growing the community before we finish off with a Q&A session. But moving on into the introduction, um, what is React? React itself is a NoSQL database, which I think everybody here already knows. So I don't need to explain what that is, which is good. Um, it's written in Erlang, which is kind of our excuse for getting into here. Um, it's used by a surprisingly large number of companies. Um, for example, the world's largest online betting service runs it. World's largest employer runs it. One of Amazon's largest competitors in the US runs it. One of the largest online holiday booking sites in the world runs it. WhatsApp's Asia competitor runs it. But I'm trying hard not to drop names. Um, React itself comes from a family of products. Originally, it was called React Data Store, hence React DS. That was later renamed to become React the Key Value Store, React KV, which is the name that most people know it by these days. There was then the React Cloud Store function, giving you access to Amazon's S3 API. Um, for some bizarre reason, they attempted to rebrand it as S2, which never caught on, which is why everybody still calls it React CS. And finally, we have React TS with a time series entry, which is a bit of the run to the family as it came to market a little bit too late for anybody to take it up, as everybody already found their own solution elsewhere. Um, anyway, people here have probably heard the story of Basho's demise. I heard a nice encounter from it over there earlier. Thank you very much. Um, and that now gives the question of React what used to be under Basho, an open source project with a closed source paged version for advanced functions. So how does that apply to the current situation? Well, open source software is free. So yes, React is free to use. It's open source software. But if you run high availability, large scale production systems where you really want to do fancy stuff and you have to be online all the time, you, of course, have to buy your own fancy hardware. You probably have to pay for support to make sure everything runs as well as it possibly can, much like you do with any open source project. But then again, the community is also there, and they'll generally help you if you ask a question, and they'll do their best to support you. They may even give you bug fixes or new features based on your request. So yeah, React is generally free to use. Is it easy to use? Uh, that could be an interesting question with this audience. We've got people shaking their head already. Thank you for your vote of confidence. <laughs> um, it runs on commodity hardware. If you saw it when you came in, there's a random pile of cables and equipment on the floor. The gentleman at the back may be able to spot it from there. That's our Raspberry Pi cluster. That's how commodity it is now. So you can actually run it off essentially a battery and deploy it anywhere you want to. Um, 
it has HTTP or HTTPS interface, depending on which one you want to talk to, which means that pretty much any programming language made in the last 20 years, be it something new and fangled like Elixir, which is fangled for me anyway, or something very traditional such as curl, can talk to it perfectly well and you can put in and get out your data as easily as you want to. And within the docs, oh, I should probably mention something about that in a second. There are many, many examples. Speaking of which, I completely forgot to add the link to our slide because I'm useless like that. But we have released the new docs for version 226 this morning. Uh, people have been complaining there have not been docs available for the uh, open source versions ever since released. They were released on our site this morning. So if you get a chance, check it out. Um, talk to me afterwards. I'll give you the link. What's new about React? Well, this is an interesting question. Uh, React itself, version 3, pretty much has one feature, and that's it. It's the OTP uplift. Um, for people who've been using React traditionally, you may be aware it was built on OTP 16. To be precise, it was built on R16B02-010, a specifically custom build of OTP 16. And it's been sitting on that for the last eight, maybe nine years. Um, some people in the audience may actually be able to tell me. And this has been causing a number of issues because, oh, yep. Four years. Four years? Yeah. Wow, I thought it was much longer than that. I stand corrected. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> OK, it's been there for four years. I apologize. It was on 15 before that. I remember that, but never mind. Oh, it's been on 16 for a long time, but Basho 10 was just about four years old. Oh, Basho 10. Oh, yeah, it's probably, yeah, I remember Basho 02. Anyway, so I'm going off topic. Um, so yes, why the OTP uplift? Essentially, it gives us access to new security features. We're targeting OTP 20 for the official release of 3.0. I already have an alpha build building on OTP 21. And we're looking to target it to then move quite smoothly from OTP 20 to jump up to OTP 22 to enjoy further speed benefits from the new file handlers, not to mention the fact that we get security, which we can literally just pull straight into it for the patches. Whereas on the old version of R16, you actually had to fangle it in and recompile Erlang, and it was a bit of a nightmare to do. Um, that said, what else is there? There's a brand new backend, Level ED. It's pure Erlang based. It allows you to get much faster throughput. And the results, which we'll talk about later, um, are quite interesting. I will show you more information about that. Um, from there, to complement the new backend, we have a new version of Active NT Entropy, which I always find hard to say. Um, this version of Active NT Entropy is uh, always on. It allows merging of Merkle trees, which is a new feature in here, that allows you not only to go through the whole thing a lot more quickly, but also allow targeted parts of AE to run on certain areas rather than requiring entire hash tree rebuilds every time you add um, new data and need things to be updated. There is a slight error in what I just said, but never mind, we'll move on. Um, next gen REPL is a new one as well. Uh, next gen REPL is based on REPL. Uh, for people who are not aware of what REPL is, uh, React has a feature called multi data center replication. It would allow you to take your data in data center A and replicate it to data center B, and if you liked, data center C and D and E as well. If you had, um, for example, multi continental deployments or multinational data centers. Um, next gen REPL is a significant improvement on the technology behind this in that it will allow you to use the TicTac AE backend, sorry, TicTac AE to target specific areas before you had to do basically a huge dump of everything. And there was no causal context at all. So if you ended up with a multi-data center, actually proper multi-data multi center situation, you could end up with data that had already been deleted being replicated back to somewhere if you set things up strangely which was a problem many people experienced. Also, there was a lot of overhead in the old version. You had to do an entire key listing for the database to then exchange the hashes to make the um, data transfer across, which was a big overhead and um, was generally only run very rarely, versus this one here, which complete a complete cycle of the entire database in roughly 15 minutes, compared to 24 hours plus for some of the larger installs we were seeing previously. Um, there are additional features, reap and erase. Within React, when you delete something for performance, we erect a tombstone. Essentially, we just mark a flag saying, this item has been tombstone, do not serve it anymore. 
What will then go on to happen later is um, your backends, Bitcast, for example, or LevelyD, will go around, you'd hit certain thresholds, and it would then go through and either compact for level DB or merge for Bitcast to then basically go through what you've currently got and get rid of all your tombstone data so you're just left with clean data afterwards. Um, within the delete function itself, there were two different styles. One was the keep version, which would essentially tombstone your data but never delete it. Now on the plus side, that meant that if you delete something like something, it was there forever. You could restore it. The minus side is it was there forever, which meant your disks filled up. Um, and the, the other option was you'd let it get blown away, but there were problems where you could actually lose your data through that. Very rare edge situations, especially if you delete something by accident and try and restore it, didn't always work very well. So how, what does this get, do to get around it? Allows you to specify which tombstones actually get deleted, which by itself doesn't sound that special. What it will do is say, look at this bucket and look at this range of keys and delete the tombstones within there, which gives you a very fine granular um, control over what is actually deleted, rather than before where you just push and hope and see what happens. Um, there's also the erase function. The erase function is an interesting one. It targets another function of React, which was used often but didn't always fare perfectly time to live or expiry. What that function would do is essentially let you write your data and then have the data disappear into the ether once your useful time has expired. For example, session data. Keep it for 30 minutes and then drop it because you'll probably your user session is expired. Um, was one of the use cases for it. One of the issues with this is that, first of all, when it expired, it didn't actually kick the, the function that handles deletes. So what does that mean? The data is technically gone, but your AEE trees, your anti active anti-entropy trees, don't know about it. So they still have the data inside there, which means your AEE trees continue to grow until the next um, time they do a uh, clean and rebuild. Also, slightly more alarmingly, is multi-data center was not aware of it. So you do a complete key listing and hasn't been deleted, so it's still there. Normally you'd like it, you delete it on side A, it gets deleted on side B, which works regularly, but when it expires on side A, side B doesn't know about it, so it just sits there. So you have to wait until your next full sync where it compares all the hashes and says, hang on, something's different here, and then fixes it, which um, could lead with stuff that shouldn't be there still being available to users, which could cause issues. The erase function is actually an active, essentially, GC. It goes around hunting for data such as this. You can basically kick it off and tell it go search for stuff. And it will look for stuff that's expired and actually delete it properly, which means we now have a functional TTL, which means AE knows about it, MDC knows about it, and suddenly the world is happy again. Um, REPL changes. This graph, which is courtesy of Martin Sumner from the NHS, so thank you very much to him. This graph shows the put time versus the put and check REPL time. Now, what that means is, if I put something on my cluster here, and then I replicate it through to my other cluster over here, how long is it before I put it here and I can then read my data here? Um, as the scale is incredibly tiny, basically, big is bad, small is good. Um, the higher it is, the longer it takes. Uh, this is selected bursty data over specific periods. And if we look at that, that's for 226. And the blue line, which has just appeared at the bottom, is for 291. Oh, sorry, 290, actually, that one's from, uh, which uses the new level ed backend. So as you can see, there's a significant timing improvement in the, trans and the copying of data between data centers just through that um, addition. From there, I'll talk about a few fixes improvements. First one. 32-bit support, yay, this is me. I kicked and complained and made patches and people finally took me up on it and that's how we have the Raspberry uh, Pi cr cluster at the background, which I think is awesome. What's actually more impressive about this is now with the IoT devices becoming more and more powerful, that means that people can then use really cheap hardware to run large-scale data collection things. For example, if you want to go and sit out as um, section of maybe 40 thermometers in the middle of the desert that report back every night, you can then take your little Raspberry Pi cluster or whatever IoT things you're doing and stick it in the desert, run it off a battery, 
And there you go, you've got this huge big data tool sitting in the middle of a desert in a small hut running off a battery. And it works, which I think is a very new way to expand the market application of large-scale databases such as this. From there, we have removal of EPA as a dependency. It was dependency in the build. It was in there for ages, and it's hardly used. We finally removed it, and it basically gives a little bit of a more stability, especially in some edge cases. We've added more Yokozuna independency. Um, Yokozuna is the search tool for React. It uses Solar. Way back in the day when it was originally released, it was quite an interesting development. It would basically take Solar version 4 and allow you to use the power of Solar indexing coupled with React stability and scalability, which gave you a pretty awesome platform back in the day. Unfortunately, time has moved on. Solar is all the way up to version 7 now. And the version in React is version 4, still. Um, but unfortunately, when it was written into React, it was written into core parts of the entire program. So you can't just say, don't build that module, because it doesn't work like that. That module is ingrained in the core. You can't remove it. So one of the hard parts was to make Yokozuna as independent as possible within the build. So it's still possible to build it. But you don't have to. It's not fully complete now, but it's significantly increased independency has been achieved. Um, one interesting outcome of this is there's a small group of people in the community who actually love using Solar, <coughs> actually love using Solar with React, and what they've done is they've started to club together and build a version that will allow you to have regular React, as in the standard stuff you can pull from the repos, and add Solar version seven to it, which then brings it back to where it was originally. So you enjoy the benefit of large scalable database, which is now on a new version of OTP, and uses a new version of Solar, which is a win-win situation for everybody who wants to be in the search industry. From there, um, another feature which was added is a hash tree token management. Now, this is a tricky one to explain, and if people zone out, I truly appreciate it. It does make sense. Um, within React, when you write something, you also write a copy to your hash tree. And the hash tree, basically, for the anti-entry purposes, will keep a log on roughly what's going on so you just know, yes, we have data, and we have data, and it correlates, and everything's happy. Um, and that happens every time you write it. Now, one of the things is, if you write that and write this at the same time, you'd run it into issues. So what we do is you allow this to be stored up. The hash tree writes would be pushed up, and they'd eventually be pushed out. But that ended up in a situation where React could actually outstrip the writing of the hash tree. So you'd end up with a situation where the hash tree grew and grew and grew and grew and grew until you basically ran out of memory, the whole thing fell over, and that was it. So you never had the writes go through. What was introduced to fix this was a hash tree tokens where you could only do a certain number of writes before it would kick in and say, I have no tokens left. Let me write this to disk, and I'm not going to let you do anything else until you do. And that works. It would basically ensure that you had no more than 90 was the default number of hash tree items needing to be right. And as hash tree items are pretty small, they're just char hashes, which could be pretty quick, pretty quick. The issue starts to come where you have so much database throughput at the same time that while your hash tree is locked putting these writes through, other puts don't get through. Um, this is a use case from one of our customers they had to have their hash tree clearing and rebuilding running at a certain period. So they'd sit it there for a month, it does nothing at all, and then in a period of eight hours, they'd bang through all their servers, which caused some interesting backups, especially as they had MDC running in the background at the same time, which was also kicking in more write cycles. So any of their users who decided to come in and try and use their e-commerce system in the middle of the night would suddenly discover that it took five minutes to buy something in worst case scenarios. And users were rather unhappy about this, as you can probably imagine. Literally click and have I bought it? Have I not bought it? I don't know. They had multiple system timeouts, and people were generally very, very unhappy. Um, a hash stream token management actually allows you to change the number of tokens within the pool. So if you know something big is about to hit you, you can artificially jump in and say, I don't want to be stuck with these 12 tokens I've got left. I want to have 1,000 tokens until this heavy write cycle is finished. And then you have your 1,000 tokens, and they're slowly used up. And then you say, OK, I'm back to normal. It's quiet. You can go write your things, and you can shrink it back down again, and it will go back to normal operations. 
Now, on the plus side, the clients I'm talking about actually upgraded to a newer version of React, which has such huge improvements in AE. They didn't need this feature eventually, but essentially the feature is there, and it's something you can play with if you need it to. Um, how do you get to a new version of React? That's always a fun question. First one is you just replicate it. You basically take your existing database and stick it into MDC, REPL, and there you go. Providing you've set up your other one on the new version of React, the two versions will talk to each other, replicate across, there's your data, new one, and then you can scrap your original one if you want to and rebuild that in the new version and then replicate back again. Simple enough. A new version is React is very convenient in that it will allow you to support multiple versions of React in the same cluster. So what you do is you take your existing cluster of five nodes, you add five nodes on the new version, you wait for everything to sync up nicely in one big ring transition, you then get rid of your five old nodes. There's often people who replace their hardware at the same time do they upgrade, and wait for the ring transition, and then you're good to go, sorted. Another way to do it is a rolling upgrade, where essentially you take your five node cluster, you say, I'm going to choose you, and you take the node down, and you upgrade it to the new version, wait for everything to finish transferring, and you do it again, and again, and again, and again. And then you're back to your new version running the same data, and there's no interruption in user service whatsoever. Um, we're going to have a quick talk about performance test results. We did some tests with 226 versus the alpha build of KV3 on a couple of VMs. Um, to give you a situation, we basically got five VMs in a cluster, and we would just hammer them with sequential, oh sorry, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, this is just startup times. One thing is KV version three runs a lot more stuff, so startup is a bit more sluggish. As you can see, um, starting one node, it's a tiny bit slower, you start five, can you read that at the back? Yep, 180% uh, of the time of five node comparison. But once we get to reads and writes, things start to become a lot more interesting. So taking a comparison of 226 as the baseline and KV3 as a percentage of that baseline, we can see that for writing only 100 keys of basically a, um, a string of characters, six characters or less. And as a background for this, level ED, which is the background, sorry, back end I'm running on version 3, is tuned to working on large sizes of data. We're talking a few megs in each transaction. So <clears throat> in this test where I'm using six text characters or less, this is really unfair on KV3. KV3 should lose because it's tuned not to do this. Whereas LevelDB is a lot more flexible and should be quite happy with this. That said, LevelDB took, um, oh, sorry, we've gone to the percentages. So KV3, 93% for 100, 90% um, for 1,000, 94% of I can't read, 10,000 and again for 100,000. So as you can see, there's already a noticeable speed increase for KV3 over KV2. Um, and if we compare it for sequential reads, again, initially, margin of error. From there, we get a huge performance boost for 1,000 reads. Um, we believe that the then slightly greater lag for 10,000 reads is because one of the system processes kicked off at the same time as we were running that test, as we didn't have time to run a full set of tests. And then finally, for 10,000 reads, 79%. So overall, it's faster, noticeably faster. In fact, when you do some of the tests, it's actually blindingly fast. You'd be surprised. And finally, again, KV3 does a lot more stuff. It takes longer to shut down. So it's a caveat. It's faster when it's running, but it's slower to start. It's slower to stop. I'm happy with that trade-off. Um, back into React as a whole, one of the important things for us now at open source is we need to grow the community. And this is key to making the React survive in the long term. So how can you guys give some love to React? Well, obvious ones. Play with React. Yay, it's fun. Please. Or break React if you're evil and tell us how you broke it so we can fix it. Develop React. Write code. My link's terrible, but I still contributed and had it published, so I'm happy. Maybe you guys can do something better as your actual proper programmers. Um, tell people about React. That's why I'm here. I'm telling you guys, please share the message. It's fun. It's good. Happy product. Um, encourage your company to use React. You know the right people. Talk to them. Make it happen. Um, one thing that actually helped with this, it's something we started doing recently, 
Our company, TI Tokyo, offers enterprise-grade support to customers, which, of course, we expect is a paid service, but we're offering a promotion where we're giving six months free support to startups who are interested in using React. Uh, at the end of six months, you're totally willing to cancel or you can move into a support contract, but that's your own. And again, use React in your open source project. Again, supporting the community, we're offering free support to all open source communities, uh, sorry, open source projects indefinitely, just to try and get more and more people to use the platform, as it's good and it's getting better. You may be wondering, well, I have an open source project. What can I use it for? You know, it's a large scale da database. What, what, what do I need this for? Um, Good one, error log collection. Basically, suck all your statistics into one place. React is big data. It's good at holding large amounts of data. Um, the example I gave earlier, where you, maybe you're doing a weather station in the middle of the desert or something, suck your data into it, use it for that. Um, it's very good as an OS layer data store where you can take other things and then build on top of it. Um, that brings us pretty much to the end of our talk for today. We're going to run into the Q&A. Before that, I'd like to say thank you very much, not only to everybody here for attending, but for also to Code Sync Global for making this possible. I've been Nicholas Ems. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, Francesco. So I think one of the things I love about React KV is that you're able to run your same applications in the same, you know, on, on the React nodes so based in the same memory space. Mm. And that gives you extreme speed. Yes. Uh, and I, I don't think, you know, prior to React, you know, it used to be Mesia, but I'm not aware of any other databases where mm. you could achieve that. How, what are you, what, is anything happening to basically provide the same to the Elixir community? Because I think that's, there, yeah, it's very much kind of a Postgres. Yes, uh, and looking to architecture, convert. Architecture, but. I'm seeing more and more these Dynamo style architectures making their way in mm. in that community. And, yeah, and this would be ideal. Reactivity would be ideal. Yes. Um, at the moment, the priority is to try and get OTP up to a comparable level. If we think about the talk this morning, the new version of Elixir is uh, one eleven. They're talking about is going to be on OTP. Sorry. Thank you very much. One ten. I take that back. I've got memory like a sieve, which is going to be on OTP twenty one if memory serves. Uh, we're currently targeting OTP 20, so we've almost caught up. I think once we're at a level where we can actually be on a comparable scale, we can then uh, work together a lot better on this. But if we're using different versions, I think there might be complaints from Lixir community of, I can't use all the commands I like because they're running an old version. But yes, it's definitely something we want to get into a lot more and see it grow and embrace the Elixir community so we can have this be seen a lot more in production. Thank you for your question as well. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Uh, you've mentioned the removal of tombstones uh, for objects. So um, I'm interested in how um, do you handle uh, this combined with uh, partitions, for example, in a cluster? Um, so in the cases where you need eventual consistency for your yes. objects, um, at some point, uh, if you're um, constrained in terms of memory, you decide to uh, chop off uh, the uh, oldest part of your, the state of your objects, or is there a strategies for that? Um, I think you've got a two-angled question there. Um, generally, if you're running a healthy cluster, you should never run out of memory or disk space. This is down to cluster planning. It's a very scalable system, so if you plan properly, you should not run into those problems. That said, going down to the tombstones issue, um, these are handled by vclocks within React. Um, so it will actually see if there is a discrepancy between two different nodes. What it will do is it will look at the vclocks and try and resolve back to where it came from and then work out which one was the original one that was correct and which one wasn't. Default setting for React is it will store your data three times in the system. So even if one goes skewy, it will look at the other two and they both say, no, 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 it's this. So React will go, it's probably that then, and rewrite your one to the correct one. Uh, with handling tombstones, it handles it in the same way. If that, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else I can help? OK. Um, one thing I should probably mention very quickly is, well, two things, actually. 
first of all, we did have a demonstration with Raspberry Pis we wanted to show you, but due to time constraints, I'm afraid we can't. But if you want to see it, come and find us at the back of the room after the session, and we'll let you come and have a play, as it's good fun. Um, the other thing is, if you're interested in either the enterprise-grade support um, provided for startups, six months free of charge, or having your open source projects, having React support from us, please talk to my partner, Peter, Peter or myself after the talk, and we'd be more than willing to help explain what options you have available to you. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.